issue that is important in the global economy, of course, is the question of uh, geopolitical risk. Uh, in the world after 9-11, you cannot forget about geopolitical risk. There are many of them out there. We know there are rising tension between Iran and Israel on the issue of nuclear proliferation. Sanctions do not seem like they are working right now. Negotiations so far have failed, and we cannot rule out I don't wish that to happen, but we cannot rule out that by next year, if sanction and negotiation have not deterred Iran from essentially pursuing a nuclear strategy, there could be a military confrontation between Israel and or the United States on one side and Iran on the question of nuclear proliferation. If that were to happen, you could have a massive spike in all prices. But the issues of the Middle East are not just related to Israel and Iran. Uh, look at the Arab Spring. It started in Tunisia, then in Egypt, then in Libya. All three countries are social, economically, politically right now in a situation of instability. It's a mess. We have a civil war in Syria. We have a civil war in Yemen. We have restless Shiite communities and minorities from Kuwait to Bahrain to Saudi Arabia to Lebanon. So those are sources of tension. The U.S. just left Iraq and then now Kurds, Shiite, and Sunni are starting to kill each other. And if you go further east, of course, you have even more unstable countries like Afghanistan or Pakistan. So I would say there is a whole arc of instability that starts in Algeria, Morocco, and goes all the way to Pakistan, Afghanistan. And unfortunately, the Middle East is going to be a source of social, political, and geopolitical tension that could significantly affect Europe, could affect all prices, and that's going to be a source of instability. I was just recently also in Asia. I spent about 10 days between Japan, Korea, Singapore, Hong Kong. And unfortunately, there is also a rise of geopolitical and geostrategic tensions also in Asia. There's a whole series of territorial disputes that involved uh, on various sides, China, Japan, Korea, Philippines, Vietnam, Taiwan, and so on, that have related to oil rights, to shipping rights, and to a whole set of historical animosity among a number of these Asian countries. We hope that maybe these tensions are going to calm down, that the leaders are going to sit down and not going to lead to a military confrontation. But unfortunately, those tensions so far are rising again. So these are the five sets of things that I would say are the five key questions about the global economy. Uh, let me now to focus, of course, on the first one, because among the tail risk about the global economy, the problems of the Eurozone are probably the most important and significant in terms of potential systemic effects. There are today seven economies in the Eurozone that are in a different degrees of financial, economic, and fiscal difficulty. I don't want to lump them all together. We shouldn't put them all into the same basket because they're different in many ways, but there are also some similarities. The countries that are in potential trouble, as we know, are Greece, Ireland, Portugal, Spain, Italy, and more recently, Cyprus and Slovenia. Now, what are the similarities? And I'm going to also speak about some of the differences. The similarities are that many of these countries have too much of a stock problem, stock imbalances. And by stock imbalances, I mean large stocks of public and or private debt. Private debt of households, private debt of the non-financial uh, corporate system and private debt of uh, also banks and financial institutions. Of course, there are differences. For example, in the case of countries that had a housing boom and bust, like Ireland and Spain, the debt of the household sector is very large. Uh, in a country like Italy, the foreign debt of the private non-corporate sector is low, while in a country like Spain, in addition to the public debt, there is also the net foreign liabilities of the banking system and of the non-financial corporates. So, of course, there are differences country by country, but all of them, to different degrees of measure, have too much private and or private or public debt. That's a stock problem. There is a second problem that all of these countries are facing right now. It's a problem of uh, flow imbalances lack of economic growth and outright recession, lack and loss of competitiveness externally, 
because wages were growing more than productivity for the last decade and therefore unit labor costs were rising and that lack and loss of competitiveness manifested itself in large and growing trade and current account deficit that now the financial investor, domestic and foreign, are less willing or unwilling to finance. So you have stock imbalances and you have flow imbalances. Today, there is a recession in the periphery of the Eurozone. These seven countries, to different degrees, are having a recession. GDP is contracting. But that recession in the Eurozone right now is starting also to spread to the core of the Eurozone. I was four times this summer in France after the election of Hollande, and every time I went there, economic conditions have gotten worse. France right now is on the verge of an economic recession. Take even Germany, that was the strongest economy in the Eurozone. There is today a very sharp slowdown of economic growth in Germany for two reasons. First of all, one of their major export markets is China and Asia is slowing down. Secondly, the other major export market, of course, of Germany is the periphery of the Eurozone. And as we know, there's a deepening recession in the periphery of the Eurozone. Now, why there is a recession in the periphery of the Eurozone and now spreading to the core? It's many and different reasons. I would uh, essentially speak about four factors. First of all, we have austerity, fiscal austerity. Now, I'm not against fiscal austerity. I think that countries with too much deficit and debt, of course, have to reduce those deficits by raising taxes and cutting spending. But any study, including recent work by the IMF, suggests that when you raise taxes too much, too fast, too soon, when you reduce government spending too much too soon, and when you reduce transfer payments, that has a negative short-run effect on economic growth. It may make a recession more severe. And I think that too much front-loaded fiscal austerity in the periphery of a Eurozone could make the recession worse. I think that the IMF has made the correct judgment in the last few months that while fiscal austerity is necessary, we have to give more time to Greece, to Spain, to Portugal, maybe even to Italy, to achieve those fiscal targets of reduction of the deficit. We have to do it, but a little more gradually. Otherwise, the recession is going to get worse. Second factor that is important is that, unfortunately, the value of the euro is still too strong. Germany is uber competitive. They can live with a euro at 130 to US dollar, even at 140, 150. But given the loss of competitiveness in the periphery of the Eurozone, a 10 to 20 percent depreciation gradually of the value of the Euro could help restoring the competitiveness of the periphery of the Eurozone. Unfortunately, for many reasons, the Euro is remaining too strong. We can discuss why, and that certainly is not uh, beneficial. Third factor is at play is there is a credit crunch. Many of the banks in the periphery of the Eurozone have maybe enough liquidity now because the ECB is helping, but they're not having enough capital. And given the Basel III capital ratio, they have to raise their capital ratio. How can they raise them? There are only two ways. Either you raise capital in private markets, but it's very hard to raise private capital, and the shareholders don't want to be diluted, or the other way to essentially achieve the capital ratio is to cut your exposure, you cut credit, and you're cutting or selling assets. But that process of deleveraging makes the credit crunch even more severe. There are plenty of firms in Italy, in the Eurozone, that are solvent, but they are illiquid. They don't have access to credit. And the risk of it is that if the credit crunch were to become more severe, firms that are otherwise viable could go bankrupt and make the recession even worse. Therefore, we have to address also this problem. Fourth problem that is in the Eurozone is that right now there is a lack of confidence. There is a lack of confidence among businesses that are not spending, are not doing capex, they're not hiring. There is not, la there is not lack of confidence about consumers given unemployment rate, given rising taxes, and they're spending less. And of course, there's not enough also uh, confidence among investors, and therefore we have to do something about that. Now, these are the negatives about uh, the Eurozone. I think there are at least three or four rays of hope about things that could be changing in the near future. 
compared to at least six months ago. If I would say that compared to the six months ago, there have been four potential positive developments in the Eurozone. The first one has been the following one. The European Central Bank has realized that it has to play a more active role in trying to reduce the spreads on interest rates on government debt and therefore on private borrowing in the periphery of the Eurozone. Some of those spreads did not were not justified by economic fundamentals, but were subject to irrationality. The risk of a collapse of the Eurozone, the risk of a rollover or a liquidity crisis on public debt. Even before the ECB has started to buy any bonds of Italy and Spain, just the announcement of this new program, OMT, of bond purchases, has already reduced uh, those spreads significantly by about 200 to 250 basis points compared to what they were in July. It's not enough, it's not sufficient, but at least is a step in the right direction. We'll see whether Spain in the next few weeks is going to apply for a memorandum of understanding. It's going to lead them to unlocking of more financial resources. In the case of Italy, I don't expect that the government until the election this spring is going to decide to apply for that uh, support, financial support from the Europeans and the Troika. We'll see what's going to happen after the election, but just the announcement of this program has already reduced interest rates to levels that are still high, but less unsustainable than before. Second positive development in the Eurozone is that the ESM, that is another pot of money of about 500 billion euros, available to recapitalize banks or help countries in distress is now being approved, is operational, and is going to be available for countries that might need it. Uh, that's another positive. A third positive development in the Eurozone is that there is right now a talk about a banking union, a fiscal union, an economic union, a political union. I think that the history of the last 100 years suggests that you cannot have only a monetary union. A monetary union alone never survives. When Italy was unified in the 19th century, it was not just a monetary union having a common currency, the lira. When uh, Germany was unified under Bismarck in the 19th century, it was not just a monetary union where you had uh, the Deutsche Mark as its own currency. Those were also banking unions, there were fiscal unions, there were economic unions, and there were political unions. And of course, if you're going to go in the direction of a banking union, fiscal union, and economic union, you also need a political union. Because if you're going to transfer essentially national sovereignty and power from nation states to Brussels or to the center, of course, there's a question of democratic legitimacy and therefore if you're moving towards a banking fiscal economic union you eventually also need a political union in order to make this thing viable and legitimate from a democratic point of view so at least there is proposals on the table of course that's not going to happen overnight but there are proposals on the table of going in that direction a fourth positive about the eurozone is that i think increasingly the europeans are realizing that uh, Europe is not just an economic project, it's also a geopolitical and a political project. Even the Germans realized that if there was a disorderly collapse of the Eurozone, uh, it's not going to be just Greece or Italy or Spain to suffer, but Germany will have massive losses, trade losses and financial losses. Germany also realizes that in a global economy in which there are rising power like China or India or existing superpowers like the United States, even a very strong Germany alone is going to be an economic and geopolitical midget. So if Europe wants to punch its weight in global economic, financial, political and geostrategic issues, Europe has to be together because otherwise in this world of rising power, even a Germany alone is going to be too small to make a difference. So the Eurozone has to succeed also for other reasons. If Europe wants to have an important role, not just in economic, but also in geopolitical and geostrategic affairs. Uh, these are the positive developments, and I think that compared to six months ago, when there was a risk of a totally disorderly collapse of the Eurozone, things are better today than they were. And there's at least some rays of hope that solutions are going to be achieved. The problem